This is episode 39 of Outlander Cast with Mary and Blake. All the way from Providence, Rhode Island, welcome to Outlander Cast. It's a podcast dedicated to the show Outlander on Stars. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm your host, Mary Larson. My name's Blake. And I hope that you realize that we made a slight change to our music and our intro. Did listen. Ready? Hear that? Yes, I do. It's just snare drums. Ooh. And we also included the fact that we're from Providence, Rhode Island. So, little tweaks, because we're getting excited for season two. Season two of Outlander, of course, is going to be different. It's going to be in Patty Friends. <laughs> I'm very excited. And so, we thought we'd do a little bit of tweaking on Outlander Cast's podcast for you. So, those of you who are new to Outlander Cast, welcome. So incredibly excited to have you and our loyal listeners on board. Just as a reminder, Blake has not read the books. No, I have not. And I do not intend on reading the books. That's kind of our shtick. That's what we do it on is. Outlander Cast. And it's very exciting because here we go into season two, into the second book of this series. And with this interview today and with our future episodes, you're going to notice that Blake is going to have theories and I'm going <laughs> to have to bite my tongue. Many of you have been tweeting me recently like, how do you do it? How do you not just tell him what happens? It is very difficult. <laughs> she it just is, stares off into I space. Do. I just stare at the computer screen and I try to hide all of my... My uh, <laughs> smiling and <laughs> or, or judging rolling eyes. So um, for those of you who have been having a tough time with Droughtlander. Oh, I'm still kind of reeling from the uh, trailer, by the way, it, during Droughtlander. It's, there's, there's been wonderful little bits. And guys, we're, we're in the last stretch. What's, what are these like sports things when you're like almost done? <laughs> I think we call that the stretch run, perhaps. Okay. Maybe even the back nine. Uh, another one would be even the ninth inning. We're, we're in the ninth one. inning. I, I get that one. All yes, right. You, yes, you do. <laughs> so, I, I can keep going. You want to keep going with these references? No, because no? I really don't know that much about sports. <laughs> <laughs> I know overtime. I know what that means, but we are not in overtime. We are in the ninth inning. I think that's great. The ninth inning of Droughtlander. So to keep you company, we've lined up a fun interview for you. That's right. So instead of just wasting everybody's time and uh, going through all this, are you ready to get in the, in, into the interview, my love? You bet. All right, let's do it. Joining us today is Richard Cahan, an actor who has been in film and starred in television shows such as Edgemont, Da Vinci's Inquest, and The 4400, but he recently switched his role to being behind the camera by becoming a writer's assistant to Outlander executive producer Ira Stephen Bear. And don't fret if you're not entirely too familiar with who Richard is yet. You soon will, because he was tapped as the writer of Episode 5 of Outlander Season 2. Richard, thank you so much for joining us here on Outlander Cast today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you guys for having me. How did you personally discover Outlander? How did I discover Outlander? Um, I'll be honest, I didn't discover Outlander before I started working on the show. Uh, Outlander was fresh and new to me. Um, I had been working for Iris Stephen Bear, the one, the only, the man, the myth, the legend, um, for three years at that point. And uh, him and Ron obviously have a long history of working together. Um, and Ira came onto the project and um, brought me on. And in about a week, I devoured the first book and just kind of dove right in to the world of Outlander. And have been eating it and sleeping and breathing it for three years now. <laughs> so Ira wrote, um, the, well, he had writing, writing credits for uh, three or four episodes so far about Lander. Uh, mm-hmm. And he also wrote for your former show, because you were a former actor on the 4400. Yeah, past life. Yeah, I was an actor for 20 years. Um, and so here you are as his assistant now, and, and now you are the writer of season two, episode five. So in other words... You have no writing credits, and but now you're, you're you're penning an episode for the flagship show of Stars. Tell me, sure. how does all that happen? 
I mean, I just I got off the plane at LAX and they just gave it to me. <laughs> um, no, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Ira, Ira was the showrunner of 4400, um, also of Crash, uh, which was also on Stars I, that I worked on as an actor as well. So Ira hired me many times as an actor, which, uh, you know, it's our relationship. Um, that's how it began. I've known him for 13 years. Um, I, I've always been a writer on the side. I've always had a passion for writing. I've always written. Um, there's a screenplay floating around somewhere, a terrible horror movie that I wrote when I was like 10 that, you know, will never and should never see the light of day, but that's how far back my writing passion goes. Uh, but the focus was acting for many, many years. And then um, about seven years ago when I decided, uh, because of a number of different reasons that, uh, you know, I really wanted to focus more on the writing, first phone call I made was to Ira and I just, it was just about really begging and saying, look, I want to learn from you. You are one of the best there is. Um, I'll get coffee. I don't care. Just, you know, let me work for you and learn from you. And um, so, you know, yes, I don't have uh, IMDb writing credits, but I've been writing for a long time and working under some amazing people like Ira uh, and now all the, the writing uh, staff on Outlander. And um, so you, you work your way up. There's sort of that the support staff uh, route where uh, you work your way up to uh, eventually, hopefully, and luckily for me, to, to, to get a script. Um, that being said, you have a lot of support and help with that. So it's not just like, here you go. And we're just going to shoot whatever you put onto the paper. You know, a lot of, a lot of people help and, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of uh, the opportunity and how it's, uh, it's turned out. Can you talk about the process and what that was like? Did, did they say, okay, Richard, we want you to write this, or did you have a script idea or did you have something in mind and did you present it to Ira or Ron? And how, how did that process work? Yeah, I think, you know, on, on, on other shows, shows that aren't uh, an adaptation of a book like this, um, yeah, I think generally it would be, uh, you know, you pitch an idea and maybe you'll get a story credit on something and then and they see that, okay, you know, you, you've got a story in mind um, and then that will work into a script down the road, things like that. <clears throat> Excuse me, on, on this, it's a little different um, because we sort of have at least the spine. I mean, it's an adaptation, but we have the spine, the skeleton, if you will, of, uh, of the show, of the story. So, um you know, this was, I, I think, I've been here since day one. It was about, um, you know, three years of working for and with the writers um, in really any capacity. I mean, the job of a writer's assistant is, you know, uh, it's varied. It's it's whatever the writers need, and every writer's different. Um, Ira works different than Matt, who works different than Tony, who works different than Anne or Ron. I mean, they're all, you know, unique in their writing and in what I can do to help them. Um, but it's, you know, about working with them and, and, and proving your worth and your abilities. Um, and then really they came together as a group and were very supportive and very helpful. Um, Matt and Meryl in particular really championed me for this script. Um, Ira, obviously, um, but the entire staff. Um, and then Ron um, was very sweet and, and gave me that opportunity and told me that he really believed in me to do that, which meant the world to me, obviously. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's kind of how it came about. That's really great. Now, of course, you really admire Ira and with good reason. And you've talked about how different it is to be a writer's assistant with different people. Can mm -hmm. you tell me a little bit of what it what it entails, like for you, just because I honestly don't know what a writing assistant would do during the day. So for you, getting to follow around Ira, can you give us an idea of what you would do during just a typical day? Yeah, I mean, the great thing about this job, uh, the challenge, but also what I love about it is that every day is different. Um, so it's really hard to say this is what you're going to do. Um, well, if it was nine to five, but it's really much, much longer than that. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, in general terms, a writer's assistant, you know, can be doing anything from being in the room, which is something that I do with, with the writers, and you're taking notes as they're breaking stories, um, as they're having conversations, as they're figuring out, in this case, you know, book to screen, um, support docs, research, coordinating, um, you know, um, proofreading, I mean, really varied stuff, whatever they need to sort of help the process. Um, where I'm really fortunate having worked for Ira now for seven years, um, you know, he works very different, I think, than a lot of writers do, in particular with an assistant. 
Um, I think for a lot of writers, and, and actually as I'm finding for myself, writing can be a bit of a solo gig and you know uh, I like quiet um, and I kind of do it on my own some people like the coffee shop but on their own um, whatever it is but Ira really you know he he works in a very unique way he really he's always had a writer's assistant that he who he works with um, and I think over the years we've developed you know a great rapport and a relationship and a trust to the point where I think you know if if he wants to bounce an idea off of me or if I I can feel free to you know throw out an idea that doesn't mean it's always going to land but you know we have that relationship and um, and yeah it's grown to that and um, and because of that. I mean, I get to sit in every day as he's writing his script, physically writing his script, and be a part of that and look over his shoulder and really whatever he needs. But for me, as a learning experience, it's it's priceless. I mean, you couldn't buy that for a million dollars. You really couldn't. Talking about this learning experience, what's one of the best things that he's taught you as a writer? Um, you know, honestly, I think it's the idea that less can be more and, and that can kind of sound cliche, um, which I read anything, but, but, um, you know, he'll, he'll famously say sometimes words are the enemy. Uh, and he says that with complete love. I mean, he's one of the most well-read people I've ever met. Um, and, and his words and his script speak to that. But, you know, I think as a new writer, you can um, fall into the trap of overwriting sometimes. You want to show, you want to get what's in your head so clearly onto the page that you end up kind of beating people with it. Um, and what you see in, in very experienced writers like Ira and like the people on the staff um, is that they really trust that they can be simple, especially in their description and a lot of times often in, in their dialogue. Um, and you trust the actors and you trust you trust everybody involved. I mean, the hundreds of people that it takes to make a show like this. Um, so I think it's about less is more and about trust. And I, I've really learned that from him. And, uh, you know, I'm still learning it. You know, you talked about putting trust in the actors and, um, and, and relying on them to... to to port, give out like the the vibe that you want as the writer. Mm -hmm. uh, so, what made you want to actually like? What specifically made you want to change from being an actor to to being a writer? Like, I know you said you've always been a writer for most of your life, and you right. you, you do have that that script when you were ten. But you said there were a bunch of different reasons. Can you go into that at all? Yeah, um, I mean, for me, you know, um, I love the creative process. And um, I think that even even at the low level, you know, the, the starting, beginning level, if you will, that I'm at, um, you know, in this show, I, I worked on this show for a year before actors came into play. Um, and so to be a part of it from the very beginning, um, even, like I said, on a, on a small scale, um, to me, that's really important, um, and I love learning about all the other aspects, which you learn on the production side, obviously, a bit as an actor, um, but you're really involved in the creative process, um, especially in television. I mean, as you work up, you know, in television, um, the writer-producer really is king, so to speak, um, you know, for making all the creative decisions. The showrunner is, is the pinnacle, um, whereas in film, you know, the writer not so much. It's more the director. So um, I think, you know, as an actor, I always loved script analysis. I think that was the most important part for me of being an actor, of getting a script and breaking it down and saying, you know, what are the relationships in this? You know, what, what as a character, what do I want from this other character and how am I going to get that in this scene? Um, and you really get to do that while staring at a blank screen and creating that as a writer from the beginning. So, um, for me, it's just, uh, it's been a really important um, transition. As an actor turned screenwriter, um, what does your acting background bring to your writing? Because not every writer, of course, has the opportunity that they've been an actor before. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, you know, I, I, I grew up on sets, and so I definitely write... I, I write, I think, with an actor's mind um, in, in a couple of different ways. I mean, I, I visualize... Um, how a scene is going to play out, how I would want it to play out as an actor. Um, and, I, and I come at it from uh, an emotional character standpoint, you know, 
would I want to say these lines? Hopefully. Um, how <laughs> would I want this delivered? Um, you know, and, and again, really going back to script analysis as an actor, you know, who is in the scene? What do I want? And how am I going to get that? I mean, you could really break down every scene in TV and film and really in life. Um, cause you know, we're all in survival mode is, you know, <laughs> what do I want and how do I get it? Um, and, uh, and I think I come at that from that acting mind and, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully that's how I tackle my dialogue and, um, and how I tackle a script as a whole. So, uh, I think it's an asset. I think, uh, you know, using that asset is, is a great thing because you want, you, you were, uh, and you know, I guess you still technically would be an actor. Um, but since you're not in Scotland where they're doing all the filming and, and right. you're they're they're doing everything. Is it a challenge for you as a writer to f still feel connected to the material and the setting and, and the actors when you're writing from afar? Uh, and I know it must be hard, but this this is like your real first go at it. Sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I was fortunate. I did have a chance to, to go over to Scotland uh, early on for a season briefly with Ira, um, which, you know, uh, that experience even though it was a while back. I mean, that definitely played into to my writing um, in season two. Um, but I have to say, even if I didn't have that experience, I think that watching the show and, and being able to see many of the cuts as they come along, and then obviously with everybody else being a fan and watching the show as it airs, I think what this show has done so well is you capture the feel and the light and the smell, as cheesy as that sounds, of Scotland. It's very specific and beautiful and unique. Um, and, and I know that from being there, but I think I also, I think we all get that from being a viewer, honestly. Um, so I think, you know, as, as a viewer, I can kind of take that and you, you get a feel and you get a sense and, and you try to bring that to the script. And then you also trust that, there are, you know, hundreds of amazing artists over there from the actors to the crew who get their hands in this and they just elevate anything that you can write. They really do. Um, and that's how we get the finished product that we do. What was your favorite part of Scotland while you were there? Ooh, um, there's, there's so much I love. I mean, again, just the light. It's so specific. <laughs> um, like, we couldn't shoot anywhere else and pretend it was Scotland. It just has such a specific look. Um, you know, for me, I'm, I'm vegan. I've been vegan for a long time. And going over there, I was like, oh, haggis. <laughs> and how am I going to, you know, am I going to die? Um, and I got to say, Glasgow was, was where I stayed, was named, I believe, most vegan-friendly city in all of UK. And, um, and I definitely found that I could walk to three different vegan restaurants. So I actually found the food and the pub culture. I love whiskey. So, I mean, I was, I was well taken care of. Wow. That, that is a good piece of trivia. I will forever take with me that Glasgow is the best vegan city in the UK. That's fantastic. Apparently it's, gr apparently it's grown into that. Yeah, I had no idea. But I can tell you, I can tell you, I, not only I survived, I thrived. <laughs> well, you could thrive all on that whiskey. I mean, geez. We're that's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things I'm fascinated about television shows is the writer's room. I, I just, I think that is the, I don't know why, I just think it's the coolest thing on the planet. Sure. So what are, since you're in the writer's room and you're there, what are, what is it like to break the episodes? And is it done as a collective or does Ron tell you guys to do it on your own? Do you, do you partner up just because, oh, I think you'll be good at this? And like, how, how does all that go down? What is the writer's room like? Um, no, I mean, it's absolutely a collective and, and Ron is, is, is that type of leader. I mean, he's very, very open to ideas from, from everybody, but particularly on this show, I mean, these are all very, very high level writer producers that he, you know, expertly crafted as a team. And so everyone brings something to the table, but it's unique. Um, so, you know, some writers might um, look at a story more from from a, an emotional standpoint, from a heart, um, whereas others, you know, okay, but you know, now let's look at this for practicality. Let's, you know, how do we how do we make this work really? Um, and then other people, it, you know, have a, a real love or a, you know for the history side of this story. So I think it's unique for every writer's room, and I think there are definitely rooms like that where people are hired for a very specific reason, and that sort of when they chime in, this is really a, a collective and a, and a group experience 
Um, and for me, as a writer's assistant, you know, in there taking notes, I mean, I'll say I'm I'm not a fast typer. I've learned to be, <laughs> um, and uh, you know, the the pains of the fingers at the end of a long day is the price you pay to be in that room without being on staff and to be able to be a fly on the wall, literally, and get that knowledge and to see how they all really work together and champion each other and have each other's backs to, you know, get to what we see on screen. You brought up a couple of things that, that stood out to me. First, can you explain the difference for, for all of us laymen, what the difference is between breaking an episode and then writing an episode? Right, so the, the breaking an episode, and again, it's, it's different on every show, but... Um, you know, is the idea of the writers in, in a room and they are sort of going through what will be an episode beat by beat or following a character arc or, or, or however they need to in order to get to a, a fleshed out story that could be then turned into an outline and then get turned into a script. Um, and again, some shows don't use outlines, others do, but... Um, and it's that idea of sort of figuring out what the pieces of the puzzle are so that you can put it together and have a puzzle, i.e. a script. So then you, you, the next thing you brought up, too, was the fact that you're not on the staff, yet mm -hmm. you are a writer of an episode. Can right. you explain how that, how that, how that mechanism works for, for everybody else, too? Yeah, so, um, I mean, my, my ultimate goal would be to join the staff. It's an incredible group, um, and, and that is, that is my goal, and I, and I hope that I'm working towards that and I'm proving myself. Um, I mean, when I get, when I was given a script, it's as what they call a freelance writer, um, where it basically means that it's a writer that's not on the staff, but that they're bringing them in to, to write an episode, which happens on, on many shows. Um, they'll sometimes bring in a writer that, you know, isn't part of the support staff like myself, um, is just an established writer and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, is coming in to do an episode. And um, in, in this case, I got to be a freelance writer um, and, uh, again, hopefully working towards that ultimate goal of, of joining the staff. So we talked a little bit about the writer's room and, and breaking the episodes, but what about writing the episode specifically? How does that process work? Um, that was, uh, for me, um, a lot of noise canceling earphones at home at <laughs> night. Um, and, you know, I'd written an outline. And so going from the outline, which is sort of the roadmap that will take you through an episode. And, um, it was a lot of, of writing and, um, rewriting and more rewriting and then getting it to a place where uh, I'd want to share it with somebody um, and meeting that deadline and um, and then passing that off. And then there's, you know, it, scripts go through many, many different versions and iterations for many different reasons. Um, you know, something doesn't work on a production side. Um, so things get cut or things get altered for time and things like that. And so, you know, there's a lot of rewriting to finally get to um, what, we, what we see on screen. Who does all the rewriting and who helps you edit your work? And does it happen as you go along? Or are there different people at different phases? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, really, especially for me as a freelance writer, any of these writers can and would and, and, and will rewrite you if need be. Um, and ultimately, that's, that's Ron as well, in, in particular as the showrunner. Um, so really, whatever needs to be molded and shaped after you've sort of turned in your script, um, depending on, on, on how many rewrites are allowed at that point and, or how many rewrites you've done, um, and then there's also a writer, in this case a writer-producer, that goes over to Scotland and actually produces the episode. And so when things on the fly need to be done, um, they, you know, will, will handle that as well. Um, so, so, yeah, changes are made, you know, along the way for, for many different reasons. Um, but on the production side, again, sometimes things just don't work or can't be done, even on a show of this size. Um, you know, you've got to stick to a schedule and a budget and... Uh, so it's it's shifted and molded, um, you know, until we get to the final product. Luckily, the schedule and the budget, that's all Ron's job, right? <laughs> Not yours? Yeah, no, no, that has nothing to do with me. That is that is Ron and, and a bunch of other, you know, brilliant people at that level who, uh, who figure that all out and, you know, and, and make it all come together. 
So speaking of Ron, um, you know, his achievements, I mean, between Star Trek and Battlestar Galactica and everything, they've been widely cataloged and his life has been discussed and analyzed up and down by nerds like me for a long time. (laughs) But can you tell us one thing about the man that, you know, again, nerds like me, we haven't heard yet, something that is like, you know, that you could share from the writer's room or something that you really like about it. So something to that effect. Sure. Yeah. Um, That people don't necessarily know. Right. Yeah. I think, um, I mean, I think that you, you wouldn't be able to know this really until you, you worked, you know, with him and for him. Um, but Ron is very laid back. And I think that that, um, might surprise some people, not because that's not how he comes across, but because I think it's, it's not necessarily the norm for someone, like you said, that has achieved all that he's achieved and someone at his level. Um, but he really brings a very laid back attitude. Um, and that sets the pace and the tone. Um, and I think he, he hires people, I mean, especially in this case with, with, like I said, you know, the level of writers that he's brought together, but, but, but across the board, um, he hires people that he trusts. And he really allows them to do their jobs and trust in that. Um, and so he really brings, you know, a laid back sense, which I, I think is a real big part of who he is. It's, you know, it's his personality. Um, and I think when, when you're led in that area, um, it, it really is helpful for everybody. So, uh, I don't know if people would know that, but Ron is, is very laid back, and that's a good thing. That's an awesome tidbit because whenever I've seen him in interviews or I've listened to his podcast, he even the way he speaks is very kind of comforting and, and laid back, and <laughs> and how he sits during during the interviews. And I've always wondered that. I thought, gosh, this guy has a lot of people he's in charge of and a lot of work that he has to make sure is going perfectly, and he really keeps himself together. So that's really interesting that that is how how his attitude is even while he's working on set. And, yeah, and yeah absolutely. That's been a huge takeaway for me over the last three years. Is um, and going forward, and you know, that's ultimately the goal. I would love to be a showrunner one day, many, many moons from now, probably when we're all living on the moon. Um, <laughs> but um, but that's a huge takeaway that I'm going to take from this job is that you know you lead with that um, type of an attitude, um, and it really sets that for everybody, um, and it allows them to do their job to the fullest. And uh, I, think, I think that's that's huge. God, I need to apply Ron Moore philosophy to parenting. Maybe if I'm calmer <laughs> at <we> home, <laughs> my kids will be calmer and will sleep if I just talk like him. It's fine, man. Just eat the Cheerios on the ground. You're fine. It's <laughs> totally exactly. cool. And then, you know, just put on Battlestar Galactica and let the kids watch. Right? You know, the funny thing is, is my daughter watched Battlestar Galactica with me the entire run wow. uh, just recently. So she's used to falling asleep to BSG. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> well, getting back to you, my friend. And as we said, officially, you've had no writing credit so far, and fans should know that writing credentials, they don't mean everything. You only get credit for most of the things you write if they're greenlit and produced, and sometimes not even then. So have you had your hands deep in Ira's last season episodes, maybe Wentworth Prison or something? Well, I don't know about my hands in there. I mean, that that is all the man Ira Bear, but... Um, you know, like I said, um, Ira, you know, he's very inclusive in the way that he works. And so I've been by his side through all of that. I saw all that come together, you know, especially an episode like the Garrison Commander or, yeah, the, you know, Wentworth Prison. Um, I mean, it's, it's incredible to really see that go from a blank page to that. Um, and, you know, and, and as far as my own work, um, I mean, I'm glad that you guys bring up the idea of, of uncredited stuff and, I mean, outside of this show. But like I said, I've been writing for, for, for many, many years and I've got, you know, projects right now that are in various stages and, and all that kind of stuff, as you do, as, you know, as they always say, an actor should act and a writer should write. Um, I mean, it's what you should do if you get any spare second in a day. Um, and I try to, to follow that. Um, but but yeah, it doesn't. Uh, this isn't something that happens overnight. And like I said before, it's not something that was just handed to me as I got off the plane at LAX. Um, you know, from from 4400, as you guys brought up. I mean, that ended in 2007, so almost 10 years uh, of really working at the writing side. And, and now I've written my first produced script, so it, it, it's a long road. Um, but uh, but I'm I'm happy to be on it. What was that time like when I was writing? 
15 and 16. Like I, we had the pleasure of speaking with him, uh, right after the finale. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he, he was great, obviously. And we, we loved him. Um, but what was there like, was there like pressure for him to write this? Cause I remember him saying that he wrote 15 in like three days or something stupid like that. And then they, the, Ron asked him to help with 16. W right. Was there pressure going on in the room to, to make sure we, you guys got that right? Um, you know, I don't know if I would say that there was particular pressure more so than any other episode. I mean, maybe in the sense of the material. I think if there was pressure, it was the material um, that was always going to be, you know, water cooler talk. Um, it was always going to be groundbreaking television. Um, you know, you don't normally see a hero of a show broken down literally and physically, you know, mentally, everything in that way. Um, so I, I think the pressure was in just how to handle the material, um, you know, in, in a way that we want to watch, but that we also really take away what we're supposed to take away. Um, so, yeah, I mean, for me to be able to be by his side while he was working on that um, and to watch and learn um how to handle that type of pressure and, you know, how to really laser focus your attention, um, which Ira always has when he's writing. It's, it's pretty incredible. His, his, you know, command over that, um, when he sits down to write, everything else goes away. I mean, I'm sure he spoke to that and it's just how he's always worked. Um, so to, to really learn from that, um, especially with sensitive material like that, um, and I mean, I saw it on the Garrison Commander as well, which again was a, a very dark, intense episode, um, and to just see what it takes to make an episode like that come together, um, and especially for a finale, I mean, that 15 and 16 ultimately were a pair as, as a finale, um, and to see those come together was, was huge for me as a budding writer. You saw, you talked about the content, you know, being there and and trying to adapt it, and especially you know the the finale or, or the, the the pair of the of the two episodes being a finale. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to that kind of stuff, are you informed ahead of time of certain lines or expressions that have to go in the script? Um, you know, I mean, I I don't I don't think so. No, I mean, I, I can't say that I was. Um, I think that. You know, you're dealing with a, a bunch of fans of, of the book and, and people that are, you know, um, or finding their way to, to being fans of the book through this process and this story. And so I think that as you read the book, there are certain lines for sure and certain scenes that really, you know, grab certain people and they're going to be different for different people. And so I think people are, are aware of that. The writers are aware of that. And you want to, you know, as you're adapting it and obviously dialogue and scenes change, you know, from the medium of, of a novel to, to television. But I think people are aware of that. And so I think naturally sort of come to that, like, oh, this was a, a really iconic scene or this was a really iconic chunk of dialogue or, you know, how can we use that, you know, but still make it work for this medium. So, um, so I don't think it's, it's, it's a mandate, but it's definitely something that people come to in finding their way through the show, I think. Yeah, so fan service is at least considered then. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because again, you're you're talking about fans on the writer staff. Mm -hmm. You know, people who read these books, all these books, many years from what I understand and from the stories that I've heard before the idea of this as a television series ever existed. Um, you know, Matt Roberts, absolutely. Meryl Davis, I know. Um, and Kenny as well. Um, but I think all the writers to a certain degree. And so, uh, yeah, absolutely. They, they bring that to mind um, for the fans because they are fans. So, again, we talked about you writing episode five. Have you seen any uh, film, any, anything yet from episode five? Obviously, I don't want you to tell me about it, but sure. have you seen it? Have you touched it, smelled it, and see what it's like? And are you happy with it? Yeah, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy to say I have seen it, and, uh, and I'm, I'm really happy with it. Um, I'm, I'm beyond happy with it. I'm, uh, I actually don't have words for how happy <laughs> I am, and the irony of that is not lost on me. Um, you know, it's, again, you, as great as you can imagine something when you write a line or two, um, when you then hand that over and it goes across the world and there's, you know, artists at the level of, of this show from the actors to the costumes to the set design to just 
everything um, and then using the material elevated and then and then you it's greater than you imagined it when you were writing it um, so it's 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 amazing I mean I, I sound like I'm gushing and I am because it's uh, <laughs> it's cool to be a part of well you've you've certainly earned it my friend uh, was it was the episode shot the way you wrote it or were there good changes made on the fly by the director or were those changes run by you at all or or were you how did that work? Uh, I mean, there's always there's always changes along the way. Yeah, obviously, you know, in 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 writing something, you know, I, especially as as an actor and, and spending time on set, I'll, I'll visualize something, um, and then you know, it might be different for for an actor on this show, or it might be different for the director, um, you know. But I can say, having watched the finished product, that there are some things uh, without getting, giving anything away. There's some things that um, that turned out pretty darn close to how I pictured them and it's kind of cool to see an image in your mind and then you see it there um, and and you hope that, that came through the script and um, and then there are other things that are different than how I pictured them um, and you go wow okay that's amazing that's very cool um, and it's it's very freeing I guess uh, you know my, my son is not that old but I, I <laughs> guess it's like letting your kid go off to college or drive or all those things where you go, okay, well, I've put everything that I can into this and now, you know, you see them, see them grow and fly. And, uh, so it's, it's been amazing. Seeing your vision on screen must've been really cool. And, uh, you know, speaking with Ira and we actually had the pleasure of speaking with Matt Roberts as well. Mm. You know, when we were speaking with them, they, they've said that, uh, they found their voice with certain characters, you know, for Ira, it just ended up being, um, Blackjack Randall. And then from sure. that, he felt, you know, pretty close with Jamie. Um, is th was there a character you felt like you had a special affinity or a voice for? Um, you know, I think, I think for me as a freelance writer on the show and for, you know, having written only one episode with obviously hopes of writing more, um, down the road, I think it's hard for me to say that, um, as they have their hands in really in every episode. Um, I think the job of of a freelance writer, especially in this capacity, is to kind of blend in and be a chameleon and hopefully get the voices, really, of all the characters to, I mean, ultimately service Ron as the showrunner. You know, you try to follow that path. All the writers are. That, that's the idea. Um, so, so I think as a as as a, as a one-off writer um and who hopes to be more than that um <laughs> you uh you just try to sort of follow those voices and really blend in it's it's not dissimilar to as an actor you know you can get hired as what they call a guest star and you come on you do one episode and the idea is sort of to you know give a good performance but you blend into the tone of the show you shouldn't stand out as a as a sore thumb so i hope that when um people watch this um they'll if, if they didn't see my name on it, they'll go, okay, this feels like an episode of Outlander. You know, it, it sounds like an episode of Outlander. So, I mean, that's the ultimate goal, and I, and I hope that I succeeded in that. So since you've been tapped to write episode five, <clears throat> since then, um, how has your life changed? Uh, are you more even, like you said, laser-focused? Are you even more laser-focused on the idea of writing and then making a career out of it? Have you gotten any other opportunities as a result of it? I'm not sure if you can talk about those necessarily, but... How has your life changed since being tapped to write episode five? Well, I mean, I'm I'm talking to you from my island right now that I purchased. <laughs> so, I mean, I think it's changed a little bit. Um, no, not at all. Um, I, you know, it's it's changed in the sense that it being given this opportunity is, um, you know, like a, a huge pat on the back, especially from from people like this, from Ira and Ron and all the writers at this level, to go, hey, you know what, we. We've seen enough. We, we believe in you. We're going to give you this opportunity. So I think it is that push that makes you go, okay, all this work over these last seven plus years, it's, it's not for nothing. Hey, you're heading in the right direction. And so it, it, I think it does help with the, the laser focus, like you mentioned, um, in that I, I hope that I have that normally, but it makes you go, okay, it's, it's working. It's, it's it's not for nothing. It's um, it's important to keep doing it. Um, and then you know it, it it definitely makes you focus on. I, you know, I always have a bunch of different writing projects going. Um, there are a couple that I'm I'm kind of trying to put together now that I, I can't really get into, but I hope to soon. Um, and um, 
so yeah, I think it's it's all just about kind of looking ahead, and again uh, for the show, looking ahead at, at hopefully writing more, um, and ultimately joining the staff, and and all of the goals that we all set for ourselves. Um, so I think it really just helps, you know, tell you that uh, that hopefully you're on the right path. I can just hear in your voice how excited you are. Really, <laughs> you, you're just glowing with uh, pride, and I'm really excited to see where season two goes. So <laughs> without any spoilers, can you talk a little bit about the tone of this upcoming season? Um, without any spoilers, that's, yeah, um, no spoilers. Um, <laughs> you know, the tone of this season, um, I mean, as, as we now know, you know, there's, there's, uh, we're in France um, for at least some of this. Um, so I think that there's a, there's a shift in tone in, um, in the world, really, um, and in seeing these characters that we know in a specific way sort of thrown into this, these different set of circumstances and this different world. Um, and so I think because of that, the show kind of moves in a different direction. That being said, it's still very much Outlander. Um, what I love about the books having uh, now, I mean, I'm, I'm just reading ahead for, for my own self. I'm almost done book four, drums. And be careful and, because Blake has not read the books. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I won't, yeah, I won't give you any spoilers <laughs> on the book, but I will, I will say that, you know, and I think you can kind of, you get the sense from seeing, you know, previews for, for season two. But ultimately, you do follow these characters in different worlds and different circumstances, different countries. Uh, maybe that's a spoiler, but, um, you know, you're following these characters. And so I think you're always coming back to, to them. And so even though I think, um, for fans of the show, there are certain things about season two that will feel different and, and you'll feel a shift in tone, um, and in, in the look, absolutely. Um, but it's still very much these characters and, um, and the show that, that people have come to love in season one. So uh, I, I think, you know, I'm really excited and everyone here is really excited to just see how people respond to that, um, you know, um, as we've seen from the previews, um, you know, to see some of our characters all dolled up for the French court and things like that, that, um, you know, I think uh, I think people are really going to enjoy. And that being said, you know, you still get all the, the great drama and uh, the love and the intrigue and all that stuff that, that you know, people have come to expect from Outlander. Um, so that's that's all there in space. I'm really excited to as I, so I read the books. Blake has, and that's part of our our podcast sure. shtick is that he's <laughs> he's new to this. But as a book reader, there are some things that really surprised me in season one that weren't necessarily in the book. So, will book readers be surprised again in season two? Uh, Got to tune in for that. I mean, there's always surprises. <laughs> There's, that's the part of great television, right? There's always surprises. Correct. Good answer. Good answer. And I have a question for you guys. So at, at some point, Blake, do you go, you know what, I'm going to read the books because I'm, I'm so invested in the show. I just want to read the books. And then what does that do to the shtick that you guys have? No, never. I will never. You know how many times people have asked me that? <laughs> no, never. I will never read the books as long as the show is on. And, and, and it's not because I, I because of the stick, although it is part of that. But Sure. Um, I just really love Ron, and I really trust him to give me a fully realized adaptation of Outlander. So it's kind of controversial to say, but this is Ron's story to tell to me, not not necessarily the books or Diana's story. For me, it's always been Ron's. You know what I mean? I hear that, yeah, to allow the TV show to stand on its own right? Um, and the books to stand on their own, which I know is something that Diana has said as well. Um, yeah, I, I, I hear that for sure. And it's been really fun, of course, through podcasting, we've been able to find a lot more members of the Outlander community who've been hardcore fans forever since the books were written. But also there's this new crop. I like to, they're like the youngins, <laughs> the new generation who right. honest to God are only show watchers. And some of them even just catch it when it's the marathon time on stars or sure. people have been watching it, you know, during Droughtlander when a friend of theirs who has watched it. So it's been really fun for Blake and I to find these non book readers who want to have additional resources for the show and we're able to say don't worry <laughs> we're spoiler free because if anyone spoils it I'm going to beat them up because I do all the best I can to bite sure. my tongue after every single episode when Blake comes up with wonderful theories and I just have to stare off into space to not give anything away <laughs> that's great that's great yeah I think it's great to you know to talk to to both fans and then other people who you know 
um, fans of the show who aren't there, you know, to compare and contrast. Not that all book fans are, of course, but, um, you know, it's just like you said, Blake, it's just fresh and it's, it's a, its own thing. Um, and, and to come at it from that, I think, I think having the mix of fans that this show does, I think that that's, that's got to be part of the success. Yeah, I've always felt like the man who created Battlestar Galactica can can pretty much tell me a perfect story almost. So I, you can, you can trust in that. We trust in Ron. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Hey, you know, we talked about previews and and us lowly uh sh- show watchers only. Um was there talk about the trailer in the writers room uh specifically about the bomb that was dropped at the end of the trailer? Oh, for non for non book readers. readers like that. That's like a <laughs> It, was right. that was that considered at all, or was that something like okay, we're putting it in there because that's what we want to do? Um, I, you know, honestly, I don't know. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I saw that trailer when it quote unquote dropped, like everyone else, and um, so I don't know. I, I don't know if that was done in the room, or if there were discussions about that, or at what you know level or stage that was done. Um, but uh, yeah, I thought it was uh, you know a very compelling trailer. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's one of those things where if I wasn't on the show, um, and I didn't know about the show and you see that you just go, Whoa, okay. Um, I'm tuning in. You got my money. Right. Mm-hmm. That's exactly. Cause like as a show watcher only, I was, it, it had me hooked like that. That's that I, I I'm totally yeah. not, I mean, not that I wouldn't be watching it anyway, but I was sold on it. But I was kind of like, okay, should I be angry about this, or should I be happy, or just enjoy the ride, Blake? That's <laughs> all I can say is just enjoy the ride. <laughs> and like you said, you know, trust in Ron. Um, if we're getting that little piece of the puzzle, um, I think you can you can imagine that it's just that it's just a piece of the puzzle. Right. And, well, that uh, that was my reasoning behind the whole thing. I, I have a you don't have to confirm this, but I have a theory that you're going to see that whole scene at in the first episode. That's that's my theory, and I'm just going to leave it there and well, leave it like that just keep yeah, you gotta tune in, yeah. <laughs> tune in. <laughs> tell all your friends tune in. <laughs> well we won't keep you anymore i know it's it, you've been on the line with us now for nearly an hour so that was way more than we actually probably <laughs> intended and thank you so much for giving us your time and and being so candid i, I it's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you well like i said pleasure's mine i appreciate you guys and and all the help and support and so thank you Guys, my love for Richard just can't, I, I can't explain to you how, how thrilled I am that we were able to have him on. He's an awesome, uh, participant on social media. Yes, he is. And a really, really enthusiastic fan of Outlander and the entire cast and crew. So please take the time to give him your love. Just go out on social media, go on Twitter. Yeah. Well, actually, I'll, I'll include the link to his Twitter profile. Uh, on our show notes for this particular episode. I think I'll do that. And what the thing that you're not going to hear in this podcast or that you haven't heard on this podcast are the 10 personal questions that you will hear or read on the Outlander cast blog uh, to get to know Richard Cahan. And uh, we, we ask things like, what's his favorite food, favorite television show, stuff like that. So if you really liked Richard, like Mary does, because she kind of has a, a, a little bit of a crush on Richard. I'm not going to lie. I think she does. It's okay. <laughs> I also appreciate that he's a vegan because it takes a lot of hard work. <laughs> so I, I, if you really appreciate this interview and Richard and what and want to get to know him more, please go to the Outlander cast blog and uh, check out those 10 personal questions. And as always, this interview would not have been possible without all of our writers at the Outlander cast blog. I won't go through all the names here. You guys know who you are. And if you go to the Outlander cast blog website, you will see who they are. But I, I do really want want to give a special shout out to Holly. She really helped us out with these questions and I was so thankful that she was able to do that. So my love, are you ready to close out this wonderful, excellent <laughs> Emmy award winning Tony nominated episode <laughs> yes, yes. of Outlander cast? All right, get off your, your high horse. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm now realizing for your birthday, I should have gotten you just a pretend Emmy for all the times that you say that we're Emmy Award winning because we're not. But we, we strive to be great. Listen, I, I enjoy my Dragonfly Inn t-shirt yes. from, from Gilmore Girls. I, I'm actually wearing it right now as we record this. That was his birthday present. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to continue this conversation, guys, we are almost there. We are almost at season two. 
Let's start chatting. Let's get Outlander trending on Twitter. Let's keep the conversation going. I know that it's really amping up on social media. So please find us online. All of our handles are OutlanderCast. And if the social media isn't enough for you, you can always reach us at OutlanderCast at Gmail. As I mentioned earlier, all of our previous interviews are on our website. You can actually find everything. Everything you need. Email, (laughs) handles. It's all there. It's all at outlandercast.com. And while you're there at the website, please check out this little button at the top right hand corner that says support. And that, there you can become a friend or Patreon of our Outlander cast or Tall Mom Media. And, but the most important thing you can do, uh, and it, it, money is great, but and donations are fantastic. But the most important thing you can do is tell a friend that we exist. If this episode was great and you enjoyed this as a companion to Season 2 and you want to continue to listen to us as Season 2 going forward... Tell a friend that we exist. Tell a friend that the show Outlander exists. We all need the promotion, and that will get us the best exposure to keep growing our podcast. And honestly, if you just go on to iTunes or Stitcher and you leave us a reading and review, the review, of course, being when you type in a few sentences, it goes a super long way. And it really helps other people not only learn about our podcast, but Outlander in general. All right. So if you can take two minutes of your time, head on over and leave us a rating and review. It means the world to us. You've already heard me talk about the Outlander cast blog, so I won't go into it too much. But please go to the Outlander cast blog. You can also reach that at outlandercast.com where we have a team of brilliant, excellent, much smarter than me writers who write about all things Outlander from the the trailers, uh, it, pub- speculation about what the season's going to be. There's a ton of great content that is there that you can consume all Outlander. And I also want to mention this too. Uh, lastly, we're going to be having a world famous Outlander cast live cast as a matter of fact, and that will be happening very soon. There isn't a date quite yet. You have to head on over to our Facebook page, and we will update you on the date there. That's right. And we might actually live stream from our Facebook page, so an extra reason to head on over there. (laughs) (laughs) So be sure to keep your eyes peeled for an announcement about our live cast. Until next time, ladies and gents, I'm Mary Larson. My name's Blake. And you've been listening to Outlander Cast. I just gotta say, this song shouldn't be this song right now. Why not? It should be the final countdown. <laughs> the final countdown. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm not sure the if I want final Europe. Final count. Well, <laughs> on there. Do you want me to play the no, final countdown? I'm just saying. I'm just saying for all of you out there who are like, Trotlander's been killing me. You know what we're gonna do? You, we're gonna play the final countdown on the live cast. That's what we're gonna do. Perfect. Bring so, it. Sound fair? Sounds awesome. All right, let's do it. <laughs>